The Martyrdom of St. Victor and His Companions Marcella, the modern Marseilles, was celebrated in ancient times as one of the chief cities of the Roman Empire. The beauty of the surrounding country, the mildness of the climate, above all its position on the Mediterranean at the entrance of Gaul, had made it the great emporium of commerce between the different nations of the known world. Its inhabitants, composed partly of the original Greek colonists of Romans, who had repaired thither to recruit their squandered fortunes, and partly of Gauls, who had forsaken the habits of their rude and independent life to devote themselves to civilized pursuits, were distinguished for all the human virtues and vices, to which their original education had trained them. This blending of different nationalities had, in like manner, produced among the people an endless variety of all forms of superstitious worship. The false deities of every country of the empire were held in honor. The only true and saving religion was held in abhorrence. As self-interested was the mainspring of all the undertakings of the people of Marseilles, it is natural to expect that flattery, rather than love or respect for their rulers, would prompt them to comply with their wishes. Hence it happened that, at the approach of their sovereign, if he were known to be an enemy of the faith, the people of this great city were wont to signalize their devotedness by so cruel a persecution of the Christians that they seemed wholly to forget the claims of nature and affection. Neither kindred, age, nor condition could soften their hearts to pity. One of the noblest victims of this foolish and servile flattery of the masters of the empire was the noble and generous soldier of Christ, the blessed Victor. Victor was a veteran soldier. Throughout his military career, he had distinguished himself as much by his bravery and success as he was eminent by the nobility of his birth and by his personal accomplishments. As a Christian, he was a pattern of every virtue, meek, humble, patient, fervent, full of charity, he was the support of his brethren amidst their trials, dreading naught but sin. It was his constant aim to inspire others with the same courage and constancy that had been his rule of action during all the troubles and hardships which had beset his eventful life. The name he had received in baptism ever reminded him that God willed him to be superior to all the wiles and assaults of the powers of darkness. The Emperor Maximian Hercules came to Marcellus. His reputation had preceded him. He was looked upon as the fiercest of the tyrants that had disgraced the Roman purple. His stay in Gaul had been marked everywhere with the blood of the faithful. Thousands had been sacrificed to gratify his insatiable desire of extinguishing the Christian name. Forgetful of his own interest, as well as of his popularity with the army, so necessary to his ambitious views, he had massacred the famous Theban legion because its members could not be shaken in the fidelity which they owed to the god of armies. Rejoicing in his power and boastful of his impiety, this wicked prince appeared to have no other aim than to render himself an object of dread to virtue and humanity. His arrival in the city was, consequently, the signal for beginning a general persecution against the Christians. Many of them, fearing the wrath to come, had already fled into the neighboring country. Others, unwilling to abandon their families and relying upon the protection of the Lord whom they served, resolved to await the storm and breast its fury. Among these, the valiant victor was indeed a tower of strength. Like a true soldier of Christ, he spent his days and nights in visiting the camp of his brethren. He cheered on the brave, he encouraged the faint-hearted, he taught the wavering to despise the transitory things of life and to look up to the abiding reward of glory that was destined to be their portion in eternity. He was an advisor, a guide, a father to all. Whilst engaged in this holy avocation, the future martyr could not long escape the watchful eyes of the enemies of his faith. 
he was arrested and led before the tribunal of the prefect. This officer, struck with the noble bearing of the veteran warrior, saw at once that it would be useless to attempt intimidation as a means of inducing him to offer sacrifice to the gods of the empire. He endeavored, therefore, to persuade him by kind words. Victor, he said, the country thou hast served so long and so faithfully makes another claim on thee. Thou art accused of despising our gods. Thou hast abandoned the military service of the empire, it is said, to join our enemies. Thou foregoest the favor of thy lawful prince and the rewards which he holds out to give adherence to the teachings of a man who, many years ago, was put to death as a disturber of the peace and a teacher of a false an impracticable philosophy. Why wouldst thou de deify and worship this man and forsake the gods who have established the power of Rome over the whole earth, who preserve her institutions and watch over her greatness? Victor replied, I have served my country long, and I trust, faithfully as you say, I thought it my duty to so to do because the service which I rendered received the approval of my conscience. Never would I join the enemies of the empire, but I glory in belonging to its best friends and firmest supporters. The gods of whom you speak I neither reverence nor worship. They are neither great, nor good, nor wise, nor generous. Their power to protect the majesty of Rome is wholly imaginary. They are, in reality, nothing but unclean demons who lead their deluded worshippers into wickedness during this life and into misery and torments hereafter. Do not suppose that I am afraid of their power or of their vengeance. I despise both. As regards the favor of the emperor, I heed it not. I renounce beforehand all rank and distinction, whether in the army or at the court of the prince. Before all other things, I am a soldier of Jesus Christ. Him I worship. In his service, I am ready to die. You seem to imagine that he was merely a man like ourselves. It is not so. He is the Son of the Most High, the Lord and Creator of heaven and earth. He indeed chose to take upon himself our human nature. He suffered and died for our redemption. But if he permitted the ungodly to treat him thus, it was because the love of his heart for us poor mortals prompted him thereto. If amid his torments he appeared to the eyes of the unbelieving as an outcast, he also showed his power by arising on the third day from among the dead, and by ascending into heaven, in the sight of a vast multitude of men, there to take possession of an everlasting kingdom, conquered by his sufferings. This is the God whom I serve and adore, and the true and living God. At these words of the bold confessor of the faith, the crowd that surrounded the tribunal uttered a loud cry of indignation. They seemed ready to proceed to acts of violence, doubtless imagining that, by doing so, they would gain the favorable regard of Maximian, who, for the presence, had made his abode among them. The prefect, however, considering the rank of the accused and the reputation which he enjoyed, deemed it proper to resist the attempts of the rash multitude and to refer the matter to the emperor. He said, therefore, to the martyr, Thy offense is against the majesty of the empire. Caesar himself is in our midst. Thou shalt have a hearing before him. He will determine thy fate according to his wisdom and justice. It matters not, replied Victor, whether I be tried before Caesar or before his representative. The God whom I serve will one day judge the masters of the earth as well as the least of their subjects. Truth and innocence do not dread the judgment of men. When it was reported to the emperor that one of the officers of his army boldly professed himself a Christian, he was exceedingly angry. He gave orders that Victor should forthwith be brought before him. At the sight of the martyr, Maximin could with difficulty contain his rage. Nevertheless, he controlled himself so far as to listen, with an apparent calmness, to the manifold accusations preferred against the noble prisoner. When these were finished, he said to Victor, Dost thou acknowledge the truthfulness of these charges? 
Some of them are true, replied Victor, and others are false. How meanest thou? That I am an enemy of the empire, or do not give due honor to the princes, who watch over its prosperity, is false. That I worship not your gods, is true. Thou hast been a brave and faithful soldier until now. I have striven to do my duty. I am not ungrateful. I love to honor and reward him who deserves well of his country. To be able to reward the meritorious services of others is deemed the noblest prerogative of princes. Maximin will honor and reward Victor, but on one condition. Name it, said Victor. Go into the temple, offer incense to the gods, preservers of Rome. I am Christian, Victor replied. Darest thou avow thyself a follower of that infamous sect? I am a Christian. There can be no infamy in being true to one's God and to one's country, Victor replied. Renounce thy odious profession, or I will make thee undergo such hardships and tortures that the very mention of them will fill the country with terror. A true Christian, said Victor, never renounces his religion. Hardships do not frighten me. A long life spent in the camp and in the field has before now inured me to them. The God, whom I adore, can and will support me amidst tortures, and I render them not only bearable, but pleasant to me, if I suffer for his sake. Obey our command, cried the enraged emperor. Go instantly, offer sacrifice to the gods. Command me what is right and just, and I will obey thee with pleasure. But I am a Christian. I offer no sacrifice to demons. The wrath Maximian now knew no bounds, yet he seemed at a loss how to make the martyr feel the full weight of his vengeance, thinking, however, that by a veteran warrior public disgrace would be more keenly felt than any bodily torture, he resolved to combine both punishments. He ordered, therefore, that his hands and feet should be bound with ropes, and that, in this disgraceful condition, he should be dragged through all the streets of the city. The execution of this barbarous sentence attracted immediately an immense crowd of the populace. They, who before had looked with reverence upon the generous soldier, now vied with one another in heaping every sort of insult and ignominy upon his person. All seemed anxious to please the emperor by seconding, in the most extravagant manner, this bloodthirsty cruelty, as if they deemed it a favor to add, in some way, to the tortures of the innocent sufferer. The savage sport is ended. The martyr, all bruised and bleeding, is, notwithstanding, taken again before the tribunal of the prefect. This officer seemed to believe that the treatment he had received would have induced Victor to desist from his firm resolve of enduring every torment rather than renounce his faith. He began, therefore, to exhort him to listen at last to the voice of those that advised him to secure the favor of the emperor by complying with his orders. The warrior, who lay before him exhausted and scarcely breathing, made no answer. This encouraged the prefect to proceed. Victor, he said, can it be possible that, soldier as thou art, Thou preferrest the very depths of infamy to the glory which awaits thee before the army and the people? Consider how great a folly it is to reject the favor and friendship of the gods and of the princes of Rome, to give up the pleasures and honors of the world, nay, more, thy body and thy very life. For what? For the hope of a reward in a life after the present? For an imaginary possession which no one has seen or known? Oh, how great must be thy infatuation! Heedlessly and thoughtlessly thou drawest upon thyself all the horrors of human vengeance, the merciless wrath of the Caesars, and all this in the sight of thy once admiring friends and relatives, who will never again lift up their heads, bow down as they are beneath the heavy load of grief and disgrace, brought upon them by their noblest representative? Reflect, O oh warrior! Consult thy dearest interests, while yet thou hast time, while imperial mercy is ready to stretch forth a saving hand. Is this a time to taunt me thus? said the martyr. Is this wreck of former strength and vigor still worth preserving? 
and that by the means which you propose? Say that you wilt cease to despise the immortal gods, whose majesty shines forth in our temples, whose blessing are bestowed upon all. Promise that thou wilt worship them even as the princes of the empire, yea, and the lowliest of the people worship them, and, with their anger, thy misfortune shall have an end. Alas, neither in this life nor in the next, whispered Victor, will I so cowardly as to follow such an advice. The prefect, who appeared possessed of but one idea, that of bringing about apostasy of the heroic sufferer, did not perceive the determined courage which animated the very countenance of Victor. He continued his address. Why wouldst thou put thy trust in a god, who lived poor upon earth, who died despised by men? Had he been powerful as God should be, would he have suffered in that manner? Renounce him at once. Do not force Caesar to condemn thee to tortures, whereof that which thou hast already suffered is but as the shadow to the reality. Be wise in time. Do not insult Caesar and the commonwealth by spurning their generous offers. As these words, the martyr, strengthened by the victory which he had gained, filled with the grace which God gives to them that are tried for his sake, arose, and summoning up all his courage, as if facing again the foes of his country, addressed the prefect, the officers, and the multitude that surrounded the tribunal. If in this trial, which I made to undergo before you all, there were merely question of the interests of Caesars and of the Republic, my only defense would be so to declare solemnly that I would never injure the emperor, that I never failed in the respect due to his person, that I have ever been ready to serve him in the profession which I have hitherto followed. Every day, together with my brethren, I offer sacrifice for the safety of Caesar and for the, for the prosperity of the whole empire. Daily, too, I present to my God a priceless and unbloody victim that he may bless and preserve the commonwealth. But would it not be the extreme of folly and blindness to devote oneself wholly a particular object in preference to another which is a thousand times more excellent? What would it be if that same object were neither according to your wishes, nor enjoyable without anxiety, nor solid, nor permanent? and if the others were all you could desire, abiding, ever satisfying, perfect. Now, there is no sensible man among you all who does not know that the favor of princes, the pleasures of this world, glory, honor, friends, health, and life itself are possessions which none can obtain at will, hold securely, or keep for a long time. Hence, you must confess that it is right and reasonable to prefer to them the unutterable and solid delights which spring from the enjoyment of God, the author of the universe. Him we possess so soon as we love him, and with him we possess all things. Out of his exhaustless and everlasting treasures he draws the boundless rewards which he bestows upon them who, for his sake, give up the vain and short-lived pleasures of this life. Hence, Death has no terror for us, since it is the way which leads to bliss. Hence, we willingly undergo torments, because they extinguish the fires of hell. Thus, we turn into blessings that which you look upon as simply evils. But you, in your blindness, worship as a god the worst of your enemies. Him you serve in this life, and thereby drawn upon yourself unending miseries in the life of the hereafter. And who is the enemy whereof I speak? It is vice that teaches by word and example the most shameful disorders. You cannot deny that the verses which you recite and sing in public are a mean of teaching your fellow men. Now, what is the burden of these songs and canticles which are heard in your theaters and in your temples? It is not an endless list of crimes and infamies sanctioned and committed by your gods. What would you punish in men, you honor in your deities, and inconsistent in your principles and practice, you degrade your reason and pervert your judgment? When the blessed martyr began to enumerate the well-known crimes attributed to the gods of paganism, there arose at first a long murmur among the spectators, which soon burst forth into loud exclamations. Some cried out that he should forthwith be put to the torture, 
other, admiring his courage and fortitude, insisted that he should be heard. The prefect, who did not abandon the hope of causing him to apostatize, said to the martyr, If thou hast aught else to say, let us hear it. Yes, replied Victor, I have fairly portrayed the character of your gods, and shown to you why they deserve rather the contempt and exhortation of rational men than their veneration. How different is the God whom we adore! How worthy of our love and adoration is he who, when we were his enemies, loved us first, yea, with an eternal love! To save us from the stares and deceits of wicked demons, he became man, not losing aught of his divinity, but clothing himself with our human nature and dwelled amongst us. Oh, how rich was that poverty which you blame in him, when, at his words, ships were filled with fish, when, with five loaves, he fed five thousand men. How strong was his weakness, which he healed all our infirmities. How life-giving was his mortal nature, which commanded the dead to arise from the tomb. Do you, perhaps, doubt the truth of these miracles? All these things have been foretold from the beginning, and according to his promises, are performed by his followers, even in our own day, as yourselves can attest. Oh, would that your eyes were opened, that you might behold the greatness of him whom all nature obeys. And then, what was there ever more holy than his life, more pure than his doctrine, more beneficial than his promises, more dreadful than his threats, more secure than his protection, more lovely than his friendship, more ravishing than his glory, who among your gods is like unto him. All the gods of the Gentiles are devils. Therefore, they and their worshippers shall be condemned to everlasting fire. But our God hath made the heavens. Therefore, blessed are they that fear the Lord, that walk in his ways. Wherefore, most noble and learned men, use the keenness of your intellect. Lay aside for a moment all hatred and contention. Examine the questions fairly, and weigh impartially the reasons advanced by both parties. Degrade no longer the image of the divinity which is in you. Forsake the unclean demons who are hurrying you into endless ruin. Acknowledge your maker, your benefactor, so holy, so beautiful, so just, so merciful, whose loneliness will raise you up, whose poverty will enrich you, whose death will restore you to life, whose saving warnings now call upon you, whose rewards invite you, that he may receive you into his everlasting glory and gladden you with his friendship forever. When the martyr ceased speaking, the prefect stood abashed and was unable to make a reply. He saw that the arguments adduced by the veteran warrior in favor of the truth were unanswerable, yet he was unwilling, or too timid, to make a frank avowal of his real sentiments. The other officers who presided with him at his trial were not less confused. Soon, however, they began to consult among themselves to know what course they should pursue, as might have been expected from persons whose minds were set upon the things of this world. They concluded to gain by force what they could not obtain by false and deceitful reasonings. The prefect then said to him, Victor, wilt thou never stop philosophizing? Victor replied, I cannot but speak the things which I know to be for your own good and for the advantage of all them that hear me, answered the martyr. Make thy choice of two things, either to appease the gods by offering sacrifice or to perish miserably. If that be the alternative which you propose, said Victor, I must needs confirm by my example what I have taught by my words. I despise your gods. I confess Jesus Christ. Now heap upon me whatever torments you may choose. I am ready to endure them all for my faith. This fearless answer of the martyr so exasperated the prefect and the officers that there arose a dispute among them, each one claiming the privilege of wrecking vengeance on the enemy of the gods. Etucus, who had hitherto conducted the trial, at last resigned his right in favor of Astrius, his brother officer. This man no sooner had the martyr in his power than he ordered him to be stretched upon the rack. His sufferings were long and intense. Victor, 
raising his eyes to heaven, whence alone he could expect consolation, prayed aloud. Lord Jesus, grant me patience, grant me strength. His hopes were not disappointed. He beheld the heavens opened, his blessed Redeemer, holding in one hand the cross, the emblem of victory through sufferings, appeared to him. He looked down upon the generous sufferer and with a smile of encouragement said, Peace be with thee, Victor. I am Jesus, who suffer in my saints whatsoever insults and torments they endure. Be of good cheer. I support thee in the struggle. I am waiting to crown thee after thou hast conquered. At these words of the Savior, all the bodily pains of the martyr suddenly vanished. His countenance became calm. His eyes shone with the brightness of ecstatic joy. In his heart, he sang a hymn of thankfulness to the God who deigned to visit and comfort his servant. Meanwhile, the executioners, although they continually relieved one another, grew weary with tormenting the unconquerable soldier of Christ. Seeing that all their efforts proved useless and that, on the contrary, the martyr seemed to derive new strength from his very sufferings, they began to expostulate with the prefect. Astrius ordered them to loosen the prisoner and to cast him into the darkest dungeon of the city. Nor was he satisfied that by so doing he had secured the noble athlete, for he could not but perceive that there was something supernatural in the whole conduct of Victor. Wherefore, to prevent every untoward accident, he gave orders that a guard of three soldiers should be placed near the door of the prison. But the Savior, who on the last day shall say to them that art at the left, I was sick and in prison, and ye did not visit me, did not forget the noble champion who had so boldly confessed his name before men. About the middle of the night, when the deepest silence reigned all around, the door of the dungeon is suddenly thrown open. A light far brighter than that of the sun illumines the martyr's cell. Struck with amazement at the sight, the three soldiers fall prostrate on the ground. They hear the sounds of heavenly melody. They distinguish words of praise and thanksgiving to God, the Creator and Redeemer. So soon as the singing ceases and the marvelous vision disappears, the soldiers arise and, with one consent, enter the dungeon, throw themselves at the feet of the martyr, and beg his pardon for the harsh treatment he has received at their hands. Victor shows to them that, were they to know the happiness of suffering for Christ, they would not pity, but rather envy him. And yet, said he, that which doubtless you have just now witnessed is but a foreshadowing of the never-ending bliss which awaits the Christian after his life. The Lord Jesus hath sent down his angels to comfort and strengthen his unworthy servant. Noble warrior, they said, have pity on us. Teach us how we may become partakers of the happiness is in the next world. What must we do to be saved? Believe in God and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, whom he has sent into the world for the salvation of men. Repent of your sins and be baptized. We believe, they exclaimed, that the God of the Christians is the only true God, the Creator and Lord of the universe. We ask for baptism. Thereupon, Victor instructs them briefly in the principal points of Christian doctrine, after which he sends one of them into the city, directing him to the dwelling of a priest. When the minister of God learns what has taken place in the prison of the martyr, he hastens joyfully to the place designated for their meeting. There he finds the blessed Victor and his two companions engaged in prayer. Without delay, they proceed together to the seashore, where the three new converts are baptized by the priest, the martyr being their sponsor. The three neophytes were called Alexander, Longinus, and Felician. In the morning, it became known throughout the city what had taken place in and around the dungeon where the martyr was confined. When Maximin was apprised of it, his fury knew no bounds. He swore that Victor should be held responsible for what had occurred. 
Immediately, he issues his orders that the three soldiers be forced to offer sacrifice to the god or put to death in a manner that may serve as a warning to others. The martyr, who knew beforehand that was to be expected from the cruelty of the emperor, prepared his brother soldiers, now also his sons in Christ, for the coming struggle, and encouraged them by these words. Soldiers of Christ, my generous companions, now is the time to display your courage as well as your power of endurance. Preserve manfully the fidelity which you have but just now promised to your glorious leader, Jesus, the Son of the Eternal God. The enemy approaches, the battle is at hand. You have scarcely enlisted beneath the banners of the cross, and already the foe, hoping to find you unprepared for the encounter, seeks to entice you from the path of duty, relying on easy victory over your inexperience. But my friends, you are not so untrained as he imagines. The discipline of an earthly warfare is not now lost for you, although the object is changed. You, who have fought for what is vain and perishable, are now called upon to battle for what is real and imperishable. So act that your heroism may win the approval of your heavenly king, who has chosen you, although but recently received into his army, to stand in the front rank in defense of religion. Let your enemies learn that, by enrolling yourselves under a noble banner, you have lost not of your accustomed bravery. Let no transitory dread hinder you from seizing the palm of victory, which lies now within your grasp. With the eyes of faith, behold your king advancing before you and opening the path that leads to endless glory. Listen to his voice as he cheers you on. In the world you shall have distress, but have confidence. I have overcome the world. Call upon him in your heart and with your voice. He hath said, I am with you all days, even unto the consummation of the world, will hear your prayer. For the glory of his name I may give my own experience as a confirmation of the truth of my words. When yesterday I lay stretched upon the rack, in the midst of my agonizing pains I called upon my merciful Savior. Instantly he appeared to me, holding his hand the instrument of our redemption, and said, Peace be with thee, Victor. Fear not, I am Jesus, who suffer in my saints the insults and torments which they endure. These words filled my soul with so great a sweetness and strength that all my pains vanished at once. Wherefore, my brothers, my sons in Christ, fix your thoughts on Jesus, the author of our salvation. Regard not the idle threats of mortal men, ye who are now on the point of being received into the joyous company of the angels, and as, but lately, in the service of your country, you would have preferred death to the disgrace of a defeat, although the one as well as the other would have hurled you into everlasting destruction. Now conquer, I beseech you, by a generous confession of your faith, that you may reign forever in bliss. Hardly had the martyr finished his exhortation when the officers made their appearance. These led them forthwith to the upper forum, where the crowd of spectators was so great that it seemed as if the whole city were present. Some had come thither to show their hatred of the Christians, other through a desire of seeing the martyrs triumph over the powers of darkness. At the sight of the martyrs, the populace filled the air with tumultuous shouts. They cursed Victor, and insulted him with every opprobrious epithet. The martyr, without showing the least agitation of mind, with smiling countenance and cheerful words, encouraged his three companions. When, however, the mob cried out to him, Restore to the worship of God these soldiers whom thou hast seduced. He turned to them and said, It is neither right nor becoming that I should destroy what I have but now built up. Alexander, Longinus, and Felician were first interrogated by the prefect. They answered firmly and briefly that, by the grace and mercy of God, they were Christians, that they were ready to lay down their lives in defense of their faith, and that no earthly power could induce them to renounce the allegiance which they owed to Jesus Christ, their Lord and Redeemer. 
The prefect then made use of promises and threats. They remained firm and unshaken, fearing, doubtless, that tortures would only serve to display their courage and the sincerity of the conversion to the faith. Maximian had given orders in the event of their not yielding to promises and threats, and that they should be put to death on the very spot. This sentence was accordingly put into execution. The three martyrs were beheaded, and thus, by suffering death in time, they secured the life of bliss in eternity. Meanwhile, the blessed victor, knowing that his companions, the objects of his anxious solicitude, were already enjoying their heavenly reward, besought the Lord with sighs and tears to make him a partaker of their happiness, as he had been a sharer in their struggles. The crowd, disappointed in the expectation of witnessing a long and bloody trial, began to vociferate, demanding of the prefect that Victor should again be put upon the rack. Their wish was soon gratified. The glorious champion was not only stretched upon the rack, but his body was mangled by the executioners with clubs and heavy thongs made of bull's hide. The martyr neither flinched nor complained. The torturers at last grew weary of their cruel task. Victor was again sent back to prison, where he spent three days in continued prayer, commending his martyrdom to God with mingled tears of joy and compunction. When the emperor heard that all the torments inflicted by his officers proved ineffective against the constancy of the martyr, he resolved to take himself the matter in hand. Victor was therefore ordered to appear before Maximian. When he stood in the imperial presence, Maximian said to him, Victor, I am told thou remainest obstinate in thy adherence to a false religion. As I have been dutiful in the service of my country, so I must needs be faithful to my God, said Victor. The God whom thou adorest is not the God of the empire, replied the emperor. The God whom I adore is the God of all empires, of all ages, and of the universe. Is he indeed? He is the only true eternal God. Besides him, there is no God. He is not the God of the divine emperors of Rome, said Maximian. He is the great king above all gods, replied the martyr. The divine emperors of Rome are poor mortal men, even as their subjects, in the sight of the true God. On hearing this bold answer to the Christian hero, the attendants of the emperor and the people that stood against set up a cry of indignation against him. Maximian, disguising his real sentiments under the appearance of an unruffled calmness of mind, ordered an altar to be placed near the martyr. A priest of Jupiter, bearing the incense for the sacrifice, stood near the altar. Maximian said to Victor, Victor, I admire thy courage. Be wise. Go take the incense, sacrifice to Jupiter, and be our friend. Never will I sacrifice to Jupiter nor to any other demon, answered Victor. At the sign given by the emperor, the officer seized the martyr, forced the incense into his hand, drag him before the altar. Victor struggles with all his strength against overpowering numbers. The spectators gaze with trembling anxiety. Conquered at last, they seem to say. The arm of Victor is already made to extend over the altar, as if ready to drop the incense, when, with one vigorous thrust of his foot, he sends it rolling through the room. I am a Christian, he exclaims. The gods of the Gentiles are demons. The order is executed. The martyr offers it to God as the first fruits of that body, which is soon to be wholly sacrificed an acceptable offering in his sight. After this, Maximian commands that Victor should be taken to a mill, that there his body may be ground to powder. This horrible sentence is forthwith carried into effect. The martyr is placed beneath the millstone, his body is crushed, but the machinery is put out of order. The state still breathes to complete his victory. After so hard fought a struggle, his head is struck off with a sword. At the same moment, a loud voice is heard from heaven. Thou hast conquered, Victor. Thou hast conquered. 
Such was the martyrdom of the glorious soldier of Christ. Maximian, who had been unable to subdue the noble spirit of these soldiers of the cross whilst they were alive, sought to wreak his vengeance on them when dead. By a last act of barbarous cruelty, he forbade the bodies of the four martyrs to be buried, ordering them to be cast into the sea. But God, who is glorified in his saints, commanded the deep to give up these precious remains. The Christians collected them with pious care and reverently placed them in a tomb hewn out in the solid rock where numerous miracles proclaimed the merits and sanctity of the blessed victor and his three companions. This has been a